Today on the future of everything, the future of photonics. What is photonics? Uh, the internet, the source of all knowledge, says that photonics is the study and use of photons or light particles for practical purposes. More specifically, how can we use the physics of light to emit, transmit, modulate, switch, amplify, and sense things? Okay, we'll see how that does. Currently, most of our high-tech devices are based on electronics, the manipulation of electrons on chips, circuits, uh, for practical purposes. The last 50 or more years has seen rapid improvement of our ability to design electronic components that have smaller, more energy efficient, and they're very useful in the full variety of devices that we know and use every day, and many devices that we don't know about, but under underlie an entire electronic world of communications computing. But light and photons might be the next big thing. Instead of moving electrons around, we can move photons around. They are more energy efficient. They require less energy, and they provide a wider spectrum of frequencies that we can use for various applications. But they have been harder to work with, and the devices that manipulate them haven't yet gone through the phase of extreme miniaturization that we saw for electronics. Some examples of current photonics victories are fiber optic cables that deliver communications. You may have heard of LIDAR, light detection and ranging, which is used on many of the new cars that have self-driving or assisted driving capabilities, and is the answer to radar, which stands for radio detection and ranging. So maybe we're moving from radio detection to light detection. And there's new types of imaging of the insides of solids, similar to ultrasound, but using light. Photonics is critical for quantum computing, a new type of computing still fledgling that promises, however, to provide a huge leap in computational capability when it becomes routine. Dr. Yelena Vukovic is a professor of electrical engineering and applied physics at Stanford University. Yelena, what got you interested in photonics and how certain are we that we can usher in this period of photonics renaissance? Well, I got interested in photonics in grad school. Uh, I came to grad school thinking I would be doing information theory um, and uh, then met my former PhD advisor uh, who showed me some things that they were doing, uh, building crystals for light to manipulate the flow of light um, and localize light into very, very small volumes um, uh, below few hundreds of nanometers. So, so that's so very micro, small. Very small. Micrometer is a million part of a meter, so nanometer is a billion part of a meter. And uh, I was fascinated by the idea that you can really um, engineer and, and make something, these really sculptures on, on a nanoscale that could be uh, really uh, manipulating a light in completely unexpected ways. Um, and uh, at that time, the, the applications of that were not completely clear. Of course, there were fiber optic communications, but the applications of, of those crystals for light photonic crystals and, and some of these uh, newer structures that people were designing were not clear, but I, I thought I... Uh, uh, would just be um, uh, interested in learning more about it for the next five years of grad school. And by the time I, I graduated, it, it became more interesting to also use it in, in the applications. Yes. And so uh, you mentioned fiber optics. And um, this is a little bit of a mixed bag because it is a huge yes, win absolutely. for yes. photonics. Yes. But, but it, 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 I think my sense of the reading is that in some ways fiber optics are really only a fraction of what they could Ab be. Absolutely. Could you explain why? Yes. Why should I be slightly disappointed yes. about my fiber optics? <laughs> well, I mean, optical fibers have been around for a really long time, and, and so did uh, a lot of other optical devices, including a variety of lasers and light-emitting diodes, and in principle, all of that is photonics and optoelectronics. Yes. But what we're going through uh, right now and what we've been trying to do for the past uh, um, 20 years or so is the idea of integrating a lot of optical devices on the same chip. So it's uh, not really new to build a new laser, uh, 
yes. laser on a chip or or an LED or improve its efficiency. Uh, what is new is uh, um, this uh, effort of integrating a lot of things, millions of components on a chip that would lead to new functionalities, and that would be really um, analog uh, to analogous to what we're doing with electronics, where right. you know in right. 20th century we went through this great revolution, where from computers that occupy the whole buildings, you know now we have much more powerful machines inside of our cell phones and mobile right. devices. That's right. And you know to to build something like a compact uh, lidar that you mentioned previously, or augmented reality glasses that would not really look ugly but would fit inside of your regular glasses, yes. right? That yes. people would would prefer to wear. You have to really build this optical chips that would integrate a lot of components and, and miniaturize photonic components inside of a very small footprint. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that uh, we are all we all hear about electronic chips and very large scale integrated chips. Yes. And we've gotten things very small. And we all, in fact, I've heard that like sometimes we're pushing up against the limits of physics yes. in terms of electrons move. So what I understand from you is that photonics has not gotten there yet. So no. I've never seen a LiDAR device. Could you describe how big is it and how big could it be yeah. with success? Yeah, so uh, you, I mean, if you've seen uh, cars, self-driving cars from yes. several companies around here uh, uh, being tested on the streets right now, LiDAR is this, this large uh, thing sitting on top of the car, which is um, so it's like the size like, of a toaster. S- size of a toaster, exactly. Right, not, so that is not small. maybe not not small. It's also very expensive in yes. tens of thousands of dollars. It's not really visually appealing. You know, people right. who care about the design of their cars would not like to have a toaster on top of their car. Right? <laughs> so, right. uh, and in principle, there are no really fundamental reasons why it has to be so big. It's big because people just integrated like off-the-shelf components, optics, okay. mechanics, and and that's where they are now. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there we could uh, uh, design things to be much smaller, and in principle, it could sit on a single chip that is smaller, uh, that is half an inch in dimensions. And that's that's one of the things that, that we're actually working on right now and others are working on. And in that case, it would be pretty much like other sensors that you have in your car. Yes, yes. So tell me, much, what, much so what, what are the challenges? So it's I, 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 we're so used to seeing things get smaller routinely, and not all of us have yes. an appreciation for the underlying engineering advances that are required. Yeah. What can't we do with photons yeah. that we need to be able to do? Yeah, so uh, there are multiple challenges. I mean, first, you cannot make things arbitrarily small in photonics because eventually you hit something that's called diffraction limit. So if you want to kind of localize things efficiently and not lose light, then uh, you cannot really squeeze it into something that's smaller than half of the wavelength. Okay. And that would be, you know, something on the order of, again, few hundred nanometers in dimensions. Okay. So you so can't really go... fundamental to, physics... There is a fundamental limit. I mean, you can squeeze it into something smaller than that, but then with, with metals, for example, instead of semiconductors, but then it would be lossy. So right. there, are, there are issues there. Good. Um, so you can't make things arbitrarily small. But having that said, uh, traditional, like state-of-the-art photonics is way bigger than that, right? right. So, for example, in uh, optical communications, uh, people use devices that have dimensions of many tens of hundreds of micrometers, yes. right? So it's a it's a little bit smaller than a millimeter, um, but well, but something you could see with the naked eye. Yeah, well, m- almost right yeah. or optical microscope. But you know, on the other hand, for those same devices, uh, we've shown and others have shown that they could be equally efficient, but way more compact. Mm, they could be something on the order of few micrometers, right? So you can kind of reduce their dimensions in all directions by by hundred or, or thousand times, uh, which means that you can integrate them more efficiently. Then the other issue that we have with state-of-the-art photonics is that it's very sensitive to the environment and uh, to any errors in manufacturing. So if you, for example, make your optical chips and chip and you have electronics there and you put it in your car, and you know the temperature of the environment vibration. changes Huma- humidity vibrations temperature electronic heats up like all of these things your photonics gets completely you know messed up out okay. of the operating point so you then you have to design a complicated system to tune it back to where it yes. should be and in now what what we're doing is trying to make it uh, really robust to errors in immune to those changes in the environment which is which is crucial because you know uh, if people 
people started with electronics building blocks that were so sensitive to any errors in the environment, we wouldn't have billions of transistors right, right. now in a right. processor. It right. would be impossible to integrate them. This is the future of everything. I'm speaking with Yelena Vukovic about photonics, our current capabilities, and where we're going. So we were just focusing a little bit on these really very practical challenges of environment, temperature, humidity, yeah. and also some of the um, uh, physical limitations. Yeah. But really, I want to go back. Um, I only mentioned a couple of applications. Tell me what the big promise is here. You, 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 you had a choice of what to study, yeah. and you, you're studying uh, photonics. What are the visions of things that are not that that are not currently possible with electronics yes. that photonics may allow to occur? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, there are some some really pressing issues that photonics will uh, help address. For example, uh, my colleague David Miller from Electrical Engineering a couple of years ago uh, looked into the um, analysis of how much of the, the total electricity in the world we consume on information processing and computing. And the number is somewhere, uh, conservatively, somewhere around 10%. So, so of all the energy? Of all of the energy goes into computing, which includes data centers. And co co um, I mean, a big fraction of that are data centers. So and we hear about people doing Bitcoin mining. We hear about oh, the yeah. data centers yeah. that Google and Facebook oh, and yeah. Apple have. Is this the kind of thing? Yes, yes, exactly. And, you know, considering all of the expansion in in, in the amount of information that we communicate and number of movies we upload on, on YouTube and so on, I mean, this is only growing, right? right? And if this current trend continues, pretty soon we will be consuming all of our energy on computing, yes. on, you know, uploading cat videos. Maybe, and then it will be hard to recharge our electric car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, and, you know, going back to that, um, uh, the, the big fraction of that is just uh, any consumption, energy consumption in all of the connections in wires inside of this. Uh, so it's you know, not even center. productive. It's not even the use yeah. of energy for productive. It's just the dissipation. Sending, exactly. Sending your your um, electrons down the wires with very high speed. And, and, and that that's a, a pretty significant fraction of that number. And, you know, unfortunately, there is no really way to, to uh, reduce that if you're using just wires, right. um, copper wires. Um, but you can reduce it dramatically or completely, almost completely completely eliminated if instead of communicating by wires, you know, you're sending electrons by wires, you are using photons to, re to uh, move information between different components of your computer or your data center. And, and are, there, are there estimates of how much energy we could save with the even the yeah. partial deployment of these uh, capabilities? Yes. So, you know, probably something on the order of uh, at least 50 percent of okay. this, because it's very hard to dig uh, 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 precise numbers. But yeah. some estimates are that at least half of this is consumed in only wires. And uh, uh, by replacing wires by, by fibers or optical connections, and of course, by mm, at the, the beginning of that, you have to, to um, uh, transfer information from electrons to photons, and at the end, from, from photons to electrons again. You're not completely replacing everything. Right, because everything. the computers might computers still have electronics. Computers are still, electronics. exactly, electrons. So where mm, electronics is not going anywhere, you're just kind of replacing connections there. Um, uh, you you will save a significant amount of, of energy. And current fiber optics can't do this. No, because there are, well, people are already using fibers yeah. in data centers, but this is just to connect to different servers inside of the data centers. And if you look at the pictures of Google data centers and other data centers, there are a lot of fibers running between different computers. But there, there are also wires inside of the computers connecting your processor to memory or connecting different cores inside of the processor. And that's, you know, I mean, and those all, are also wasting energy. Wasting energy. We all know that, you know, when you touch your, your laptop, you know, it heats up. All of yes. your electronic devices heat up. And that's just uh, energy dissipation. And that could be significantly reduced by photonics. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Dr. Yelena Vukovic uh, about hot computers and how to cool them down uh, using the mirror miracle of photonics. So I know that you have um, recently written a bunch of very technical papers, but what the goal is actually prototyping some of these new miniaturized yeah. devices. Yeah. Uh, and I, it, 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 it sounds to me from looking at these papers that you're bringing together um, all of the capabilities of modern science in terms of computation and modeling, uh, deep learning even to some extent, uh, and of course your physical understanding of these systems. So can you describe for us, and, and one particular paper which was just fascinating was putting light through diamonds. Yeah. 
why is that interesting and what was learned from that experiment? Yeah, so so going back to the, the way we design and build photonics, uh, which, which was the per first part of your comments, you know, I realized even in grad school that, um, you know, the way we design these photonic devices is basically there is a finite library of things that you learn in grad school and then you try to put them together and tweak them and then, you know, you make your trip. And... Uh, I was always wondering uh, why we design things certain way. And it looked to me that uh, in many of these cases, we just um, adopted some designs that people could uh, make by hand, you know, many decades ago when, when they were building like microwave systems, not even yes, photonics. Yes. And we just adopted them in, in photonics and we just kept uh, going So it was like the legacy of legacy random of, stuff exact, that people invented. Exactly, that you learn in grad school and keep doing. I mean, it works okay, but then when you want to build very large system, it doesn't really work that well makes things quite complicated. And also components are very sensitive as we were talking about it, uh, um, regarding environmental errors and then they're very big and so on. So I've been always, um, you know, um, uh, obsessed with this idea on kind of finding the right solution to the problem. Why something has to be so big or can it be more efficient or can you design it for a particular, you know, function and there are some new functions that we need to have. And, uh, of course, this was quite challenging like 15, 20 years ago, yes. but right now we also have much better computing hardware with all the uh, boom um, in, in AI techniques. And, all those and hot form. computers all are the, actually useful. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so we started combining techniques of uh, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning and, and optimization with design of photonic devices, where you can really kind of explore all the possible solutions to find the right one. And and what we've realized is that, uh, you know, there are so many solutions that are better than what we normally use uh. in, in, in in today's systems that it's, uh, you know, quite remarkable. I mean, you can, you can find dozens of solutions that are smaller by hundreds or thousands of times and equally efficient and robust to errors, uh, which made us very op optimistic about uh, integration of, of millions of And this of is a computational design of a, exactly. of a small component exactly. that you can then and build and exactly. test to see exactly. if it does what you think. Absolutely. And, and you know, then we spend uh, a, a long time, you know, building prototypes uh, at Stanford and measuring them and showing that they work. And, you know, we spent also last three, four years working with major foundries showing that these um, kind of crazy looking designs that look very unusual from the perspective of manufacturers of electronics and photonics are actually something that could be made in a foundry. And yes. and we've shown that that's possible, which means that there are absolutely no barriers to, to build building these um, uh, systems right now on uh, with high throughput manufacturing. So this is very helpful because now I see that you're you're painting a future where, first of all, we have more components that have been designed exactly. with these new technologies. The components maybe provide a greater set of choices for the engineer who's trying to compose them together to build chips that yeah, do yeah. things. And the designs that you're creating, and I saw this in the, in the publications that you wrote, they're kind of working on the first try, that the computer modeling really does work, and it doesn't create something that when you actually plug it in, melts or just doesn't work. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Dr. Yelena Vukovic about the future of photonics next on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Yelena Vukovic, and we, uh, we had just mentioned the possibility of talking about diamonds. I love diamonds. Uh, you, you you shot some light through some diamonds. Why did you do that? What did we learn? Yeah, I mean, uh, diamonds are actually very interesting materials for photonics and also for, for quantum technologies, quantum computing, quantum, quantum communication. Um, and, you know, we all know that you can buy diamond in different colors in jewelry. You know, when you when you buy really pure diamond, that doesn't really have any color. So so when you buy a pink or, you know, blue diamond, it basically comes from defects in that diamond, from, from yes. presence of impurities inside of diamond. And uh, those impurities are actually very interesting for, for uh, you know, building all of these the technologies that I mentioned, in particular in the, for, for building quantum sensors or, or quantum, quantum computers or quantum communication devices. And, uh, of course, you, you don't want to take a piece of diamond that's already pink because that means that it has a lot of impurities that you can see with your naked eye. Yes. You, you actually want to get it so that it has kind of only, well, only some, like, few of these impurities okay, or maybe so hundreds of them, perfect, but they're almost perfect. But right? not you quite. Can, but not quite. It would still have these impurities inside. And um, 
uh, you can use these these impurities as as what we call quantum bits um, uh, to to kind of build all of these technologies. You can use them to generate individual. Photons and yes. photons are individual particles of yes. light, right? So, so light surprisingly consists of particles, uh, right? And there you cannot really divide that photon any further, right? So that's, um, you know, Einstein's Nobel Prize was for photoelectric effects, yes. and then that uh, the whole field of quantum mechanics pretty much started with those discoveries. So you can actually use that that uh, single impurity to generate one photon, one particle of light, use it to communicate between two parties, and if you use that one photon to communicate, and someone tries to eavesdrop on you um, by measuring, by somehow observing that photon, you would know uh, that someone was eavesdropping on you. So then you can make absolutely okay, secure so communication systems. that sounds extremely practical. Yeah. So, so first of all, let me ask, the diamond it, is a naturally occurring diamond or do they have to be grown specially? You can either use naturally occurring diamond uh, or okay. you know, mo most recently almost all of us have been using synthetic diamond, okay. ultra high purity diamond, and then, then we insert uh, on purpose at specific location the Impurities. I see. Yeah. Uh, and then you know where to shine your exactly. light, so to speak. Exactly. Then you generate these these uh, signals from yes. the impurity. But now you said something very practical, which is uh, under normal situations, we can have eavesdropping. Not yeah. not with this technology, yeah. but with fiber optics yeah. or electronic systems, you can put some sort of device around the wire or around yeah, the absolutely. fiber optic, yeah. and it can it can intercept the exactly. signal, and it's not detectable. No. But what you just said, if I if I heard yeah. correctly, is that in this case, if they try to do the equivalent of of, of exactly. eavesdropping into the system, uh, they won't be able to. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So so in today's fiber optic communications, right, you send uh, optical, like, pulses, laser pulses, and that's how you communicate between two parties. But someone can always pick up a little bit of your signal and, and essentially... Siphon you know, it off and exactly. use it for nefarious and, and, purposes. And eavesdrop on you, right? But if you send uh, um, information in, let's say, a single photon or some other quantum state of light, and yes. that could be what we call entangled photons or something else, but let's say, let's talk about single photon, and someone tries to, to eavesdrop on you, they can't really pick up a little bit of a single photon. That's impossible because that's um, indivisible particle of light. Yes. Nobody can cut half of it, right? right. Uh, which means that if they try to to uh, tamper with your information to measure the state of, of that photon and, and pick up information, they'll per perturb it. Quantum and you can mechanics. detect this. You, you and you can detect that per some some uh, interference on the channel. There's a photon happened. missing. Exactly, exactly. Because you can kind of check some some number of the photons you send and see if they're messed up. Oh, yeah, then someone was eavesdropping on me. Gotcha. And then you stop and, you know, repeat communication. Later. So this could be the basis f uh, if scaled up. Absolutely. And if, if as, you, as we discussed in the prior segment, if you can create all the components to manipulate this on a yeah. chip together, exactly. this could be the next generation of ultra high security uh, optical transmission. Yeah, absolutely. And there are systems, I mean, you can buy commercial systems for what is called quantum communication. This is yes. quantum communication, but they're limited to short distances, maybe some thing on the order of you know a few tens of kilometers but if you would like to send your signal from uh, east to west coast or yes. from us to europe then you cannot use these secure systems but instead you need to build something called quantum repeater and you have to put this special it's repeater like an amplifier station. exactly of some kind. but you know you can't really amplify quantum signals right. so what, it's that a was special your whole point <laughs> exactly yes, yes. so you have to kind of build this distribute what we call quantum mechanical entanglement which is basically the main resource for building quantum computing quantum communication everything right yes. quantum sensors you have to distribute this entanglement from from east to west coast and then you can securely communicate over long long distances this is the future of everything i'm russ altman i'm speaking with dr yelena Vukovic. And now we're talking about the word quantum stuff. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people, they, they get fuzzy eyed when they hear about quantum. So uh, we've just talked a little bit about quantum communications and that some of these technologies are going to lead to extremely uh, long distance and secure communication channels. The other thing we hear a lot about is quantum computing. Yeah. So before we get into how it might work, can you tell me what is the place and the role it might play. Yeah. Some people wonder, is it going to replace our current supercomputers? Is there going to be a quantum computer in my cell phone? Or is that the wrong vision of the future? That's completely wrong vision of <laughs> <Okay>. the future. <laughs> 
uh, because classical, classical, or oops, sorry, traditional computing that we have is not going anywhere. Quantum computing um, uh, really um, uh, is is much better and much faster than than traditional computing, only for a very small number of problems. And okay. uh, those the problems were where it outperforms by 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 many many orders of magnitude. To classical computing are factoring of large numbers, which is the basis of today's cryptography. So um, once again, it's going towards security. Security, again. yes. That one is uh, related to security. Then the other problem, I mean, there are a few other problems, including searches of unsorted databases, right? Yes. For example, you know a phone number, but you don't know who it belongs to, and you have a phone book. So how do you find, you know, who that phone number belongs to, right? Yes. Without like reading all of the entries in a, in a book. And, uh, you know, some problems which are more uh, physics oriented, like, um, you know, simulating other materials, discovering yes. new materials, discovering new chemicals. Um, so those are the problems where where it would be outperforming traditional computing, but that, not like speeding up your, your Microsoft Word or... or okay, so know, it won't anything. be an ultra fast, um, although it'd be interesting to see if it would help with Photoshop, but let's not go there. <laughs> um, but let me ask you, in a, in, when, before we uh, got on, on the air, you were saying that one an interesting analogy is that um, if we think about current computers uh, getting an input, doing a computation, and giving an output, that the fundamental approach for quantum mechanics is very quantum computing is yes. very different. Yes. And and how did you characterize that? So I mean the the basis of that is it, everybody knows that in in today's computers we have bits which is zero and one right. Yes. So your your switch is in one of the two possible possible positions and yes. that's that's how all of the modern computing works. With quantum computing, your you have quantum bits or qubits where your switch can be in arbitrary superposition of zero and one. So it's not just zero or one. It can be anywhere in between, right? And then um, uh, that actually allows you to run some some specific algorithms by kind of putting everything in a superposition of different possible uh, inputs and different possible outcomes. All at once. All at once, right? And, and it can do the computation kind of exactly, in parallel, in parallel on yes. all potential inputs. Exactly, exactly. And then when you when you perform your, your measurement on the system, it would collapse into a certain, certain uh, answer with certain probability. Yeah, and, and actually that helps because you were talking about looking for a phone number in a phone book. Yeah. I know how to look at one entry and compare it to my exactly. phone number and say yes or no. Exactly. The problem is in New York City, there's 4 million entries. But if you can use these exactly. qubits yes. to simultaneously exactly. look at 4 million numbers, exactly. then your answer, Absolutely. I'm snapping my finger, comes back very exactly. quickly. Exactly. So where are we with quantum computing? Is this a pipe dream or are we starting to see them uh, deployed and built? Well, uh, uh, there are machines that uh, even major companies uh, such as IBM and Google and some some startups such as Rigetti, for example, are, are building uh, and they're based on, on so-called superconducting quantum bits. Um, I mean, that's uh, currently... They're not using your diamonds. Not yet, uh, but uh, eventually they will have to use uh, in order ah. to connect them <laughs> I into quantum internet or even to scale them further. Um, but, you know, right now they have about 50 quantum bits uh, okay. and that's right roughly at the border where, um, you know, people are expecting maybe we can start uh, analyzing some problems that could not be classically maybe simulated. Yes. You know, maybe people are talking about quantum advantage. Maybe we'll see some these quantum computers really overcoming, you know, the power of classical so computers. So we're right, but on, hasn't the cusp, happened yet. right on the right cusp. Right on the cusp, but not really yet at the uh, stage where these quantum computers would be really uh, convincingly more powerful than classical machines. And, uh, um, you know, that's the current platform, which is, you, know, you can view it as an, an uh, again, analog of um, uh, vacuum tubes right? yes. in the uh, 40s or 50s. Um, probably will be scaled to something on the order of 100 or thousands of quantum bits, but for truly functional um, a quantum computer that would be uh, really useful for, for factoring large numbers and breaking cre uh, codes, uh, cryptographic codes, um, we will need about 1 million of okay. qubits, physical qubits. And the question is, how do you get there? And it's quite uh, conceivable that we will need to kind of change the architecture and go from something like superconducting qubits to semiconductors, you know, these impurities in diamond or, or some other material. And a lot of people are working on these alternative platforms, which would be equivalent to silicon 
transistors yeah. as opposed to vacuum tubes. So very early days with a lot of promise. Yes. Well, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.